Um, first of all, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name's Scott Somerville. I'm the Managing Director of Opera. Uh, we're a, um, a specialist indoor air quality uh, testing and consulting and technology company. Um, we've been going about 20 years. We've got offices in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Perth. My colleague in the top left there is Dean Cooper, our National Sales Manager. Um, bottom right, uh, Arthur Melnitschenko. He is a Centervox product specialist and spend lots of, spends lots of time talking to Norman. Um, I've known uh, Norman for the best part of 10 years now. Uh, he's come out mostly hospital engineering conferences. Um, Opera's involvement in the indoor airspace uh, spans all types of accredited lab for testing HEPA filters and biological uh, safety cabinets, fume cupboards. So we do a lot of work in PC3, PC4, um, biological containment uh, labs, doing um, decontaminations as well as, you know, particle counting and but we also are quite active in the indoor air quality space for the commercial property sector. So, um, yeah, our experiences from uh, through that indoor air space is, is quite significant. And over the years, um, you know, we, we looked at different technologies that could actually help our clients improve their space. And I suppose over the last couple of years with COVID-19, because previously, when people spoke of air, air disinfection, it was really only, you know, the, the R&D laboratories, the QIMRs of the world, all the containment laboratories and, um, yeah, and, and, and hospitals started to look at um, air disinfection rather than just air filtration prior to COVID. Um, but since COVID, uh, everyone's focusing on, on um, you know, all sorts of technologies. Like I think fighting this pandemic is like a game of golf. Um, UV is not the only solution. There's pressure control, there's PPE. Um, UV is, is one of the engineered solutions and that's what we're gonna focus on today. But um, you know what we're telling our clients, if there's some hospital engineers and infection control people on here, we, we've had issues before COVID and there'll be issues after COVID. Just north of Australia, you've got the largest concentration of tuberculosis per capita anywhere in the world, also spread by air. There's a measles outbreak before COVID in Melbourne, also spread by air. So, um, you know, I think people are starting to warm to um, air dis My exceptional scholar and friend, uh, he's uh, yeah probably one of the smartest, that, but I really believe it. He's an intellectual giant. He's he's someone I I, I never get tired of listening to. So, um, Norman, I'll I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, thank you, Scott. Uh, I'll share my screen here. Okay, got it. Can you all see my screen now? Okay, so here we go. I, I will try to keep it below 45 minutes, uh, uh, but there's a lot of stuff I wanna to talk to you about. And it's, it's mostly, uh, I, try, I would try to demystify a lot of what you've heard or think it is about uh, how ultraviolet works. I wanna to go to what it can do and what it cannot do. Uh, and uh, here's the, the agenda that I planned uh, with with Scott and Arthur and Dean. Uh, I want to talk a bit about first about airborne aerosols, which are the, the cause of the major cause of spread of the COVID-19 virus. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about filtration, the limits of filtration. Then I will get right into how UV disinfection works. Then we'll go into how do we apply it to cooling coils. Uh, and the nuance how we apply it for air disinfection. It's not the same, uh, same prince. It's the same principle, but different way of looking at it. And then finally, I want to show you a little bit of what we've done in automated UV disinfection uh, units for healthcare. Uh, part one, airborne aerosols. Uh, aerosols are 
uh, droplets, well, you know, you look at 10 microns, 10 microns is the limit to what we can see. Uh, basically, if you sneeze real hard or cough, you may see a few 10 micron droplets. Uh, those will don't, won't stay in the air very long. They will tend to fall on the ground. Uh, those are called fomites, and, and there's some contamination there too. But the most uh, uh, dangerous one and that we did not suspect at the beginning of the pandemic uh, are the airborne three microns, one microns that will stay for hours in still air. If the air is moving, uh, they will stay there all day uh, if there's movement in the room. Uh, and those can contain uh, about 10, 000, up to 10,000 viruses. Uh, there's a load of viruses that are in those droplets. And those droplets are not there only when we uh, sneeze or cough, when we just talk. Uh, when we just talk, we emit a lot of one, two, and three micron droplets that are totally invisible, and they float up in the air. And that was the uh, main contamination that occurred on the uh, Princess uh, ship that was uh, in, near Los Angeles at the beginning of the pandemic. Everybody was staying in the room and yet uh, they ended up having cross-contamination from one room to the next. Uh, these particles, these aerosols can be filtered out. Uh, of course, if you look at a, uh, a good MERV-13 filter, uh, they will take out 90% uh, of the uh, 10 micron particles. So they can do a first good job at removing some of these floating aerosols. Uh, this is a very nice study. I have the reference at the bottom, if you, uh, if you want to take note of that, uh, that shows that uh, going above a MERV-13, you don't get much benefit and your cost of, of use just increases. Uh, there's a sharp turn at, around MERV-13 and where the risk of infection stops reducing, but the cost keeps going up. Uh, so that inflection point is really the, the point where you want to stop. So don't don't go installing a HEPA to catch those particles, it's not worth it. But going from a MERV-7 to a 13 uh, reduces your risk by 15%. Now let's look at a MERV-13 filter, which is probably the optimum for, for our case. It still lets a lot, of, like the SARS-CoV-2 virus is about 0.1 micron. Uh, so if it floats up in the air, uh, that's what you can get. Uh, so you're getting like 40% catch on the, on something that's 0.1 micron. It's not so good. It's good on larger stuff or one micron and more, and it's good for a very small, but in between, like every filter, uh, it's got its weakness. Now, the idea with UV is not to replace the filter, but to complement the filter. If we add UV on top, here's what we can get by adding UV after filtration. Uh, we can uh, totally eliminate uh, and I'll explain how it works. Uh, the TB, for instance, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, can be eliminated uh, without increasing the pressure drop. That's the nice part about it. So you, you don't impair the flow and you don't increase the pressure drop and you can get uh, performance that are uh, as good as a HEPA filter without the, uh, uh, the inconvenience. So uh, right into it, how does UV disinfection work? Uh, first, I wanna show you what is uh, ultraviolet? We have visible light between 400 nanometers wavelength up to 700. That's what we see. Everything else on the infrared side and heat and radio wave, we don't see. And on the left side, ultraviolet, X-rays, cosmic rays, we don't see that either. Uh, they have different properties. UVA, you can cut them off with sun glasses. That's reflection on water. UVB is the sun tanning uh, that you use uh, uh, solar solar uh, sun tanning lotion and, and, and solar protection. Uh, you know that in Australia, that's very important when you have white skin. And UVC, uh, fortunately, it does not reach the Earth's surface. It is blocked by the ozone layer. So it's filtered out totally. And that's fortunate because UVC is germicidal, it means it, it destroys life. Uh, there would be life on Earth if we didn't have the atmosphere and the ozone layer to protect the ground. And UVV is higher energy still, and that has a capability of breaking oxygen molecule and producing ozone. So it's actually the me mechanism that's producing the ozone in the upper atmosphere, which in turn blocks the UVC. Now, <clears throat> UVC operates 
right at the root of life. It operates on RNA and DNA. Uh, we all have learned recently that the virus is RNA based, but the principle of replication of a virus or any microorganism is the same. If you look at what this is, what a RNA and DNA is, it's strictly a replication, it's a photocopying machine, a molecular photocopying machine that is. Every G base finds its C and its A finds its T. So it's a binary system of zero and one, if you want. It's a genetic code and every living organism has its own coding. What we do when we bombard this molecule with UV, we are impairing, we are actually altering this molecule at several points. It's called dimerization of timine pairs. When you have two adjacent Ts, we bind them together uh, with the UV light at 254 nanometer, the UVC. As a result, this molecule, when it tries to reproduce again, it's jammed. It's just like, a, I like this analogy, it's like a zipper where you have two adjacent pins that are jammed, that are uh, melted together your zipper will not work. So it's really mechanical. And if you make enough damages on that zipper, which is the, the molecule that tries to, to, to replicate, uh, it will become sterile. It will not be able to infect the host. And as a result, as a result you're getting the disinfection process. Here's a, a reproduction of what you find in the ASHRAE Handbook uh, 2019, Chapter 62 which deals with ultraviolet air and surface treatment. And if you look at the wavelength at the, at the uh, abscess of the graph, at 260, 265 is about the peak of germicidal deficiency. Uh, UV lamps using mercury are around 254, which is about 85% efficiency. So it's a, it's a very, uh, well, a very useful method of you're hitting almost at the maximum of that curve. If we could make a lamp that's 265, uh, we would get a better, uh, slightly better. But the idea, as I'll show you later, the idea is the dosage. Everything is about dose. And dose is about the product of intensity and time. Intensity is the power per unit area in watt and time in seconds. So if you multiply watt by seconds, you get joules. The definition of a watt is one joule per second. So the larger the dose, the more you bombard the molecule with photons of, of certain number per second, uh, the more probability you have of hitting the double Ts and uh, impairing the, uh, uh, creating some damages and impairing the, the, the replication process. So it really is a, uh, a photochemical reaction. And basically there is no escape from any type of microorganism. With this technology, we can sterilize almost anything, not almost, just about anything because it's all DNA RNA based. For instance, I've been asked recently, uh, will, we, will we be able to uh, deal with the Delta variant? Uh, of course, bring the Delta, uh, the Epsilon, the Phi, bring them all to Omega. <laughs> There's no, it will still be a combination of uh, RNA sequence. The sequence may be a bit different, uh, but uh, we will still be able to neutralize it uh, with uh, enough hit of uh, the zone. So there is a, this is a, this is how it's calculated basically. There's a dose and the constant of susceptibility is, a, is basically a success rate of that dose given to that molecule, that uh, RNA or DNA. So knowing the dosage, knowing what kind of microorganism we're dealing with, we can provide a dose and expect a certain reduction, a certain response. So this is the dose, a classical dose response that is published in the ASHRAE handbook as well, and that everybody uses with ultraviolet. And by the way, this is all the, most of the work derived that we use right now these days have been done 30 years ago by the water industry. All the water that you drink right now in, in plastic bottles have been sterilized with ultraviolet uh, using, using this basis. And uh, the water is sterile and it doesn't taste like, uh, like chlorine. That's the idea of using UV instead of using chemicals. Now, these rate constants are published for all kinds of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. 
you can find uh, what is the UV susceptibility and uh, who's done it experimentally. So there's many ways of validating the, uh, the basis of this. And if you supply it, if you know what you're dealing with, what microorganism, and if you supply a, a given dosage, you know you will get a certain disinfection rate uh, based on this. Part three, I'll get into how do we disinfect a cooling coil? If you remember, when we're dealing with coils, it's a non-moving object. We're shining on it with a UV light and there is no movement. So we have plenty of time. Remember the dose is the intensity multiplied by time. For cooling coils, we have lots of time. So therefore we don't have to put a ton of watts uh, of UV watts on the coil. For air, it would be very different. For air, it's moving and it's moving fast. We only have half a second to do the job. For a cooling coil, we have an hour, typically. And I'll explain why uh, an hour uh, later on. Uh, what we're trying to do with coil disinfection is to eliminate what we call a biofilm, but it's pretty unhealthy as I'll show you. Um, we have seen some pressure drop increases due to the biofilm building up on the fins of a coil. And of course, you can see a heat transfer uh, being inhibited by uh, the presence of mold on coil. And you end up having energy saving. You can, you can get rid, rid of them. The design criteria is to, of course, we want to the intensity as uniformly as possible on the surface to be disinfected. Now, what, what do you find on a coil? What lives on a coil? Uh, you look at a coil and you don't see much because it's all packed inside, but sometimes we'll see some, uh, some molds. Uh, the Aspergillus niger is the toughest one. It requires a dose of 448 millijoule per centimeter squared to kill 90%. So that's a, that's a pretty tough one. Then the other one, uh, actually the Aspergillus niger is black color mold. The Cladosporium vimici is green, is green mold. Pilsinium also is greenish, bluish. Then you'll find bacteria also, Legionella bacteria, uh, which is known to cause Legionnaire's disease. They're found on cooling coils. And Pseudomonas, which is also a, uh, uh, a, a human pathogen that is uh, highly undesirable um, for infections. This is typical samples that we take on coils. Uh, with a petri dish, and uh, I'm I'm sorry if it cuts your breakfast, but that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty typical that you find all over the world. Whether it's on Australia, in Canada, or in South Africa, we find those molds everywhere in cooling coils system. Want to see what's in there, but. It's pretty typical. What we do, this is the, on the left, the F on on coil. So the dosage is rated on this, how much dose we need. We want to do 99% kill. So we double the dose for 90% up to 896. That's the dosage for 99% elimination. How fast do we want to do that? Well, we want to do it faster than the reproduction rate. That's how you, you win the war against uh, molds and microorganisms. You have to destroy them faster than they can reproduce. And we found out that if you apply 99% elimination within an hour and you do the calculation, you do the math, 896 millijoule per centimeter squared divided by 3,600 seconds, it boils down to 0.25 milliwatt per centimeter square, which is 250 microwatt per centimeter square. And by doing that, uh, you are really ahead and making sure that you don't have a, a birth rate that is faster than the death rate of the population. And that's the issue. If you look at the population, if you look at the red uh, line on this graph, the population grows because uh, our, our death rate is less uh, than the birth rate. And if you look at the blue line, that's where we want to be. Uh, we want 
point we have a negative exponential and it, it dies out. Uh, now it's a bit tricky with, um, with coils because coils have a certain number of fins per inch uh, and they have certain thickness. So the, the exponential growth inside uh, can be pretty dramatic. I'll show you after this. Well, this is uh, inside of a coil, a coil that looks 10 feet by 10 feet, and it's got 10 inches thick and 10 fins per inch. I use a simple mat to, 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 show, uh, to show the idea. With a coil fate that looks 100 square foot, uh, in fact, the total inside surface is more like 20,000 square feet. A coil is a, is a huge surface. Uh, to 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 cultivate uh, molds, and it's inside. It's it's very tiny. So we have to look at the multiple reflection inside that coil. To kill that in one hour, it's on the surface. Inside, it will take longer. Typically, the reproduction rate of uh, Aspergillus niger, which is the toughest mold, is about it doubles between one and three days. In fact, you have like twenty four hours. But that 24 hours, that was, that's what it will take to penetrate inside the coil and, and do its job completely. As a matter of fact, when, when the coil is less than 12 inches thick, which is typical, 250 microwatt per centimeter square is sufficient. When the coil goes up to 18 inches, you want to push it up to 500. And when the coil it gets to 24 inches, quite rare, uh, you would want to go at 1,000 microwatt per centimeter square. Most of the time, uh, you, when you, you play around 500, uh, you're in good hands and uh, the measurements, the validation after shows that the coils are really clean all the way through uh, with samples taking on both sides of the coil. All of this, of course, cannot be done. All the coils are different sizes, different conditions. It cannot be done like, like guesswork. Uh, it, it has to be done properly using a software where you calculate just like a lighting software for a, where you look at the ceiling and you see some, some light. Some, someone has eventually calculated that you need a certain amount of intensity on the ground and did a distribution distributed the lighting system to get the results. So that's exactly what we're doing here with uh, a sizing software. We're positioning the lamps at different points so we get an even, as even as possible a distribution. Uh, you see the minimum UV intensity, average intensity, maximum, and we're trying to get uh, at least uh, less than an hour for the uh, Aspergillus niger. In this case, uh, we're getting the maximum time of survival is 33.68 minutes. So it's, uh, the job is done. And we know because of the coil thickness that will go, it will go through uh, the coil. Um, here's a, a typical coil. After when we, before treatment, that's again the uh, before, and that's the after. So that's a way to verify. You can also verify the intensity on the coil using a UV meter to make sure that your minimum point, say, is above 250 uh, and, and make sure typically it's in the corners or somewhere like that, that you have the lowest level, uh, but it will work its way through and you will be able to verify after installing the, the, the UV lights, uh, something like, uh, takes about a, a few days and you can take a collection of samples and see that it, it's all gone. Uh, this is typical uh, installation at uh, Verizon in Texas in this case. Uh, this is very important. I put this so you can uh, have a look at this uh, very important publication that is being ignored uh, by this the, the UV industry a lot. And I always bring it back uh, it's been published in 2008. It's a, it's a landmark study that shows that UV lamps are sensitive to airflow and to cold airflow. The wind, it's called a wind chill effect. Uh, UV lamps output is dependent upon the amount of mercury that's vaporized inside the, uh, the, the, the lamp. If the lamp is cooled by a cold airflow and it's placed, and it's typically it, when it's placed uh, perpendicular to the airflow, its output can drop dramatically. It can drop by 50%. Uh, 
And if you don't use a reflector or protect the lamp from this cooling when you're putting it uh, uh, in crossed position, uh, the output can be basically less, well, half, half of what you expect. And the disinfection will not be as good. This is uh, inside of this publication. And it shows, and, and that doesn't matter what kind of lamp. All lamps contain a gas and mercury. They all operate on the same principle. So if you cool your lamp too much, your output can drop. If you look at this, if you have a cold spot of 10 degrees, you're, you're down to 20% output. Uh, it's, it's, it's really dramatic. That's why you have to protect that lamp from excessive cooling. One way is to use, that's what we use, use a reflector that protects the lamp from direct hit of the air. And the second way is when you cannot do that because you want to say irradiate the air, then you place your lamp per parallel to the flow, not perpendicular. You try to avoid uh, cooling the lamp, over cooling the lamp, so your, uh, your UV output is, is not penalized. So the wind chill factor, an example of uh, air moving at two, two and a half meter per second, which is typical, uh, in, in an air uh, handler, temperature air of 15 degrees Celsius after cooling. Well, your chill factor, you've lost more than half. Uh, and that's the, that's the, that does what it tells you. It tells you do not put a bare lamp in an airflow. It's not a good idea. And that's just for wind chill factor. Then there's the fouling that will come if, you, uh, if your lamp is not shielded properly. So the lamp will foul and with the chill factor, at the end of the day, a lot of people were disappointed. You, they said, oh, we tried UV, it didn't work. Well, it was probably misapplied. And that's, it's very tempting to just put a bare lamp and say, huh, it can do the job. Well, yeah, practically speaking, no. So how to specify UV dose for air disinfection? Now that we've seen a coil is not moving, we have an hour to deliver the dose. Well, for air, it's a different ball game. Uh, for air, we're only having a fraction of a second at the speed of air in a duct to do the job. Now, how are we going to do this? First, well, put the, the lamps parallel to the flow to uh, increase your contact time. And here I, I show a little calculation. The actual calculation involves integration and summation over all the lamp elements and, and uh, finite element method. But the principle is the same. If you take the dose being the power multiplied by time divided by an area, and you let the time being equal to the length divided by velocity, quite simple physics here. Well, the dose boils down at the end to be the power multiplied by the length of contact divided by the flow. So if your length of contact is short, if your lamp is perpendicular to the flow, you don't have much length of contact and you, you're, you're having a fraction of the delivered dose. So it's a, it, putting the lamp perpendicular not only gets it cold and inefficient, but also you're losing all that contact length that prevents uh, the delivery of the proper dosage. You're only getting a tiny fraction of the dose that you would get if you would place the lamp in the right direction. Um, just it's just basic physics. Now, if you, how do we know a lamp emits so much UV? Uh, it's called the crease. This is when you have a lamp, you need a photo sensor at one meter, you can measure in the midpoint. And that with using that little formula on the left will tell you what is the total UV output of that lamp. And that data would be used uh, to calculate, to do the calculation that uh, you saw previously. Now, knowing that, knowing that we can deliver, how many, uh, what's the dosage? Uh, what's the scale of dosage that we use and what kind of results we can expect? Well, if you are in an office space, if you apply 2.5 millijoule per centimeter square, it's, a, it's the yellow line, yellow column. Well, that's the kind of disinfection that you can expect from tuberculosis at the top. And you work your way down, you'll see SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19, you'll get 99% with this dosage. If you're in a hospital, you may want to double that dose and you go into the orange belt. 
if you have your site of operating room that you want to go to green belt and so on until you end up with black belt, which is mostly for surface disinfection, but you use that because now you're targeting molds on surfaces. In the air, it's much tougher to target molds because they're moving, the air is moving fast and you have that much time to deliver the huge dose required for mold spores. But uh, on surfaces, you do. So this is a typical uh, scale that we develop at Sandyvox uh, to find out if you don't know say, because sometimes you have an office or a hospital, well, I don't know what I'm targeting. I have all kinds of, of uh, microorganisms that I want to get rid of. I don't know exactly which one. Well, you can decide on that type of scale where uh, what level of disinfection you're looking for. And these are the, the expected performance. This is what it looks like in practice. Uh, it's a unit with four or five lamps. It can go up to 600, uh, 60 inches uh, length. Uh, typically about 800 watts of, of power. You can use several of these units for to fit different sizes of duct. Again, it's done with a software. It's all calculated uh, based on the size of the duct, the reflectivity of the material, the velocity of the air. And if you look at the past summary here, you can choose influenza, virus, mycobacteria, uh, like tuberculosis, uh, SARS-CoV-2, Legionella, uh, we have a list of over 70 common uh, microorganisms that are found inside buildings that you can choose from. And uh, we know that have we done the, the job properly, what, what kind of, of disinfection rate we're getting in the first pass, second pass, because if you have recirculation, the doses are, are cumulative. If the duct is uh, very flat and wide, you may want to put two units, two by wall side by side, and then you can do the calculation. So it, it is application is everything in this technology. Uh, it's not a hit and miss. Uh, and your target uh, contaminants are different. What percentage you want to to is is the key. Now, how do we validate this software? Well, this software was when we first use that, we got it validated by EPA, Homeland Security Lab, uh, where they wanted to test against three types. Uh, one type is a, uh, a virus, MS2, that infects bacteria, the ceratomarcescent, which is a vegetative bacteria, and atrophaeus, which is a mold spore. So it, it is tested and we came with calculation and they came with measurements and we saw a match. Uh, all these these software, uh, it's not magic. Uh, if the physics is well taken into account, uh, you're getting the dosage uh, onto the microorganism, but you're getting the disinfection rate. So that's how that's how we pretty much validate the the precision uh, of this. We recently did a test with uh, on SARS-CoV-2 again in Belgium and another lab, a Petri lab, using a small unit, a re very recent unit that we got. And we predicted 99% elimination in 15 minutes. And the lab test came out 99.4%. So pretty good, uh, pretty good correspondence. Uh, over the years, we, we, had our, we, pub, we did a lot of publication. I think we, we pretty much, uh, we've been doing this. I've been doing this for 26 years now. Uh, we pretty much pioneered the application of ultraviolet lit for HVAC. It was, when I started, it was mainstream in water, uh, but now it's getting mainstream inside buildings for the same reason, uh, because it leaves no residual and you can, it's a predictable uh, method. Uh, McGill published in the Lancet Medical Journal, McGill University, uh, back in 2003. And to this day is the only epidemiological study uh, that was done over with over 800 disinfecting cooling coils to a reduction of respiratory symptoms and overall sickness of the occupants of the building. And resulted, they measure 99% reduction of microbial concentration on surfaces inside the ventilation system. Uh, during the pandemic, the CDC sort of realized also uh, that uh, UV was effective at inactivating SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we did participate with ASHRAE uh, way back in 2008 and the latest chapter 
uh, we participated into demystifying and putting standards together so it can be used by engineers uh, to add this to improve indoor air quality. And the US EPA, while well, I told you about it, that's one of our first study to validate our, our software. Now, uh, we've come with uh, the, the healthcare industry is quite, uh, per, you know, qu quite picky on uh, infection, as you know. And uh, so we try to do something there to, do, to be automated. Uh, I like this word from uh, Dr. Weinstein, and he wrote that in the late 90s. And I think it's, it's so true. Uh, changing human behavior is too difficult. So you have to take the human factor out of the equation by making the unit, if possible, automatic. And that's what we've tried to do with, uh, with UV. These units, you roll them inside the room and they do a cycle automatically and they disinfect surfaces. Uh, typical time of operation is about five minutes. These are each 800 watts of power. And if you put them on each side of a bed, for instance, they cover the shadow area and you get a, a pretty good all surface, all line of sight surfaces are uh, thoroughly disinfected. Uh, the target was C. diff uh, mainly, which is a, a very big problem in hospitals. That's the uh, same units in uh, Spain in an operating room. And this is the test that we've done uh, at the beginning of this process. That was done in 2014 in Minnesota in a specialized lab, ATS lab. C. diff was eliminated after five minutes at 99.999. Uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus uh, also, and uh, MRSA, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, was also disaffected up to six log. So that's a, a pretty sterile condition once you, you've achieved that. And the nice thing with light, it doesn't miss any spot. Um, it goes, uh, everything that it sees, it gets disinfected. It doesn't unlike uh, chemical cleaning that can miss some spot. Uh, this is uh, one of our latest unit for bathroom. Uh, when we walked into a hospital, we were told the bathroom is probably one of the worst place for people to, uh, to get sick and spread viruses. And plus the visitors are coming in all the time. So this is a module that operates automatically with motion detector when the door is closed and the door, the, the, the room has been used by someone, it starts an automatic cycle and does a disinfection. This is a study of this unit uh, done in the uh, bathroom and utility room where the wheelchairs and, and all the utilities are, uh, are stored. And with the UV on and UV off, uh, all of these studies, by the way, can be found on our website at uh, Sanuvox in the section uh, of uh, uh, technical section uh, of, of products. So in a nutshell, uh, and I'm op open for question after, uh, UV is, is really a proven method to keep the coil clean and, and energy efficient by removing the biofilm. Uh, air, if you, of course, if you provide the right dosage, air disinfection is so much more effective when, when the lamps are installed parallel. Uh, some people I've seen have tried to do it. It's like, yes, it works, but it's like, uh, you know, riding with a square wheel. Uh, Engineer, of course, you need a software, you need to do it properly. Uh, so many times I've heard, oh yeah, we tried UV, it didn't work so well, we're deceived. Well, that's probably because it was misapplied. And uh, it uses no consumable, no chemicals, efficient and low cost. That's why the water industry actually uh, decided to, to shift to use less chemical and use more UV. For, for disinfection uh, because it leaves no aftertaste and uh, it's, uh, it's a very economical way. So I'm open to all kinds of questions and I thank you for, for your attention. All right, thanks Norman. Um, just gonna hand over to Dean Cooper now who's, who's gonna run the Q and A side of things. Oh. Dean, you might wanna go to the the Q and A section, and just go through those questions. And Norman, if you can answer them, as well. 
Thanks, Scott. Well, we've got six questions here at the moment. Um, I think Norman has covered most of it, but we'll get through them. Norman, can you see those questions as well? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm so that one from Mark Hopman, basically yes. what he's saying there is with coal cleaning inside an air handling unit, will that do the air disinfection in large areas like train stations, museums and shopping centres and so forth? Uh, you know, coil cleaning will do very well on anything that sticks to the coil. If, uh, if it's a small, tiny virus or bacteria and it flies by and it passes through the coil, it's not, if it doesn't stick to the coil, you will not really disinfect it. You will not do a good job because you don't have enough time. So, because you're cross flow, uh, your, your time, it will eliminate uh, anything that grows on the coil, which also produces toxins and emits atmosphere. And uh, so it's a, you know, coil cleaning is a good place to start. Uh, it will remove a lot of things that are released in the air. But if it's a, again, if it's a, uh, a microbe that is airborne and doesn't stick to a coil, uh, it's not doing a very good job at disinfecting the air. So basically, I think the message you're getting across today to everyone, and you know, we hear quite often as well, is that coil UV cleaning it's not air disinfection. Because as you mentioned earlier, what we need to do for air disinfection is to have the lamps parallel to the airflow and not in front of the coil. They're two different systems. And we get asked that question quite often. There's another question from Cindy Tan. Uh, what are the chances of UV population establishing itself on the coils as this will affect disinfection time? So again, you know, with coil disinfection normal, um, you know, when we uh, calculate the amount of UV for a coil, we always have the minimum of 250, which will kill Aspidelis niger. Um, and also we do it under an hour. Um, you know, the reason for that is, um, is because, you know, mold growth um, can grow pretty quickly. But look, what I'll do, I'll let Norman um, just talk a little bit more about why we do it um, under an hour when we do the software. Uh, Dean, what was the question? Uh, why, when we do the UV calculation on the software um, for Aspidelis niger, why do we why do we do it under an hour? Okay. Well, what we're trying to do here is to eliminate the the toughest mold faster than its uh, reproduction rate. So the reproduction rate can vary a lot. It depends on the condition of humidity and and of course, feeding, uh, they, they feed on dust, uh, basically uh, organic dust. Um, but typically the doubling time is between a day and three days. But on the surface, immediate surface where the lamps are installed, there's very, uh, well, there's never a problem, but it's inside the multiple reflection inside of the UV. Although aluminum is a good reflector, you lose some by multiple reflection. So to work your way through the coil and make sure you disinfect on down to the other side, the opposite side, uh, that's, where, that's why we need that criteria of one hour. If we try to do it at 24 hours, by the time you're finished, uh, there will be some more growth on the opposite side of the coil. All right, thanks for that. Another question from Michael Ward. We measured a UV intensity output that decreases with time higher temperature in a cabinet with no airflow. Do you need to have an airflow present to prevent the lamp from overheating? Correct, correct. If, uh, if there's no airflow, uh, the lamp output typically drops by at least 50%. Uh, it's, it's just not a very efficient way of, uh, of running it. Uh, UV light. The, the reason why it happens is because you're vaporizing too much mercury inside the lamp and you create some fog, fog of mercury. That means you emit a photon and then you reabsorb it immediately so it doesn't get out of the lamp. Uh, and the reverse is true. If it's too cold, 
then your merc you don't have enough mercury vapor and your number of emitters of uv emitters goes down so uh, that's why there's a peak uh, the ideal operating temperature is about 40 celsius for a lamp anything hotter or cooler you'll see a reduction another question from andrew mclean for air disinfection we're installing a chain of lamps end to end effectively increase the contact time Installation in an air duct. I think what Andrew's trying to say there is with the UV lamps uh, being installed horizontally or perpendicular to the airflow and not in parallel. So, you know, I see this quite often as well, and we all do, where we see lamps um, being specified uh, perpendicular to the airflow. Now, that's not going to work, is it, Norman? You've got no contact time. Well, yeah, your contact time is very short. And the second thing, you're cooling your lamp. Your lamp uh, operating temperature will not be optimum. And uh, the two combined together, uh, <laughs> you may get some results, but typically, really, it will take you about four to eight times more lamps to do the yeah. same job. <laughs> you can do it, but it's just, uh, you. it's like uh, you're trying to, to, uh, uh, to drive a ha uh, a nail with a hammer, but you're using the wrong side of the hammer, if I may uh, say. An another question from Andrew. Um, does UVC deteriorate plastic? Uh, yes, some plastics are sensitive to UV, uh, like plexiglass and, and some uh, hard plastics will discolor. Uh, before you break a plastic with UV, it takes several hundred thousand hours it's not it's not going to be a, it's several years before it could even damage it because the immediate surface gets uh, depolymerized basically it breaks the the, the uh, it breaks the molecular bond but then that discolored plastic protects the plastic under so you do get a, a significant discoloration of white plastic because white uh, pigment is titanium oxide. Titanium oxide absorbs uh, UV a lot and it becomes yellow. Uh, but the, any uh, carbon-based plastic, like uh, dark uh, uh, colored uh, black plastic, does not get affected as much. Uh, rubber is the same, does not get affected as much. Uh, but you have, yes, most, uh, one thing you have to protect for safety is all the wiring. All wires that are uh, mm. should be in conduits and, and protected, so you don't uh, you don't destroy the insulation on wires. Uh, Marco Hopman has asked a question with respect to the in-room units. What are the risk of what are the risks to the occupants if they happen to enter the room while the UV units are on? Okay, all UV units that you've seen are equipped with motion detectors. Like the towers, they have four motion detectors. So there's a redundancy. Any movement that is detected, the unit shut down. Same thing with the bathroom unit. There's a door switch and there are two redundant uh, motion detectors. So the units are shut down automatically when someone enters. Uh, the, there is a, actually, it's not like, if you see a UV light, it, it doesn't burn immediately. There's a certain dosage that you can take that will not harm you. It's six millijoule per centimeter square. So typically you can, depends on the light intensity, uh, but typically if you open a door and you've seen some UV light for a fraction of a second, it's not gonna hurt you. Uh, but all the UV system must be designed, that's very important, must be designed with safety in mind that you should not expose yourself because that UV light will not make any difference between good and bad DNA. <laughs> it will attack your DNA the same way it attacks the DNA of uh, microorganisms. So it will, it will do damage to your skin, will do damage to, to your eyes. Uh, mind you, it's, uh, it penetrates less deeply than uh, UVB outside. Uh, you have more chances of having a skin cancer from going in the sun and taking a dose of UVB than UVC. UVC does not penetrate as deep in, in the skin, uh, but it's unpleasant and it gives you the same feeling as a sunburn uh, if you get exposed to it. And uh, you'll feel itchy eyes also, which is also uh, unpleasant. I've experienced it myself. 
Uh, Clint Walker has a question here. I think what he's trying to say is, um, look, his question is, do you see the tech once implemented into isolation rooms and hospitals providing a reduction in the mechanical requirements? I think what Clint is trying to say there is, you know, once you install, say, a biowall into the return air supply air duct, is there any other mechanical um, changes that need to be made? as far as your filtration goes, your airspeed goes and everything else? Well, the, the, the installation of a bio wall, adding a bio wall to a filtration system does not increase the pressure drop. Uh, it doesn't occupy enough cross section of a duct to have any significant impact on pressure drop. Uh, one thing you have to be, to be aware of, some filters are not UV resistant because they're made with glue. Uh, natural fibers are resistant. Fiberglass fibers, they can handle any kind of UV. Uh, actually, UV doesn't go through glass. If you have a glass window, the UVC will not go through it. So fiberglass is very resistant for the same reason. Uh, but if, you, uh, if the filter is made with polymer, uh, the UV will damage it. So you don't want to expose the filters directly to, to UV light. Uh, Cameron Robbins has asked a question here, and I think it's pretty much about surface um, UV. Um, I think he's referring to, you know, a UV line of sight, so where there's shadowing, the UV obviously won't um, disinfect that area. Do you just want to elaborate on that? That's right. <clears throat> UV is a direct line of sight technology. If it's in the shadow, uh, it will not work. You're not getting the exposure in the RNA molecules, so you're not getting the disinfection. It really is a kind of sight, and anything in the shadow will not work. That's why, like a bed or something like that, you need either to move the unit from one side to the next, do two cycles, or you have two units and run a single cycle. Uh, Luke has asked a question we get asked all the time. What's the life cycle of the UV lamps? Typical life cycle of UV lamps is 17,000 hours. That's for a, uh, not a continuous use because you can turn them on and off. Uh, if you turn them on and off like 10 times a day, uh, 10,000, 10, uh, 30,000 times a, a year, they, they will last two years uh, because the, uh, with the electronic ballast, uh, the starts are not so hard. So they, they will withstand that. That's, that's pretty typical, 17,000 hours. Uh, on the lamp that we use, which are a bit bigger, mind you, not all manufacturers use lamp. Uh, we use a T6 format, which is a uh, 19 millimeter diameter. Uh, so the cross section is bigger. Uh, the current density is lower. And as a result, they will let, they, we guarantee them for 17,000 hours. Most of the industry use what they use in the water side. They use the T5 lamp. Uh, the T5 lamp are good in water because they're well cooled, but uh, in air, they tend to overheat a little bit and they, they don't last as long. Their density of current is higher and they, their typical life guaranteed are, are one year. So you'll hear both one year or two years but they're not the same type of lamps. Uh, Peter McGarry has asked a question here. With the modular units, the strength of the UVC light would decrease the further it gets from the light source following, following the inverse square wall. So with the hospital, bad example, how close do you have to have the UVC equipment um, to the energy source? An additional question, I, I, I assume you keep people away from the energy from the modular unit while the hospital bed, for example, is being disinfected. So basically, I suppose what he's saying there is, you know, with those uh, mobile units for um, operating theatres and, um, and wards, hospital wards, when they wheel them in, you know, um, as far as distance goes, if you're trying to disinfect the bed, how close does it have to be from the surfaces in that room? Okay, for a disinfection time of uh, of fifteen uh, of five minutes, our reach is about three meters. Uh, 
for to provide the dose. But you're absolutely right; it decreases with the square of distance. But that's for a a point source. Uh, for a linear source, it's not as fast. Uh, you get several points. So, but but it does reduce with distance. And and yes, you're looking at about three meter radius uh, to get a five minute disinfection. Uh, for for instance, for C diff, uh, which is the toughest. Uh, reference microorganism that we're trying to to target. Uh, and you, yes, we have, we have another question. Uh, it's from an anonymous attendee. This is an interesting question. How does Sanyu Vox compare with the other comparators, American UV or sterile air? What are the main differences between Sanyu Vox and the other UV systems on the market, Maman? Okay, well. I, I would say we're the only one that uses a T6 lamp, which is a slightly bigger lamp uh, for the reason I just mentioned, because they last longer. Uh, we're getting 17,000 hours of use. Also, because they're a little bit bigger, they, they're less sensitive to wind chill also. Uh, as, the, as an object gets bigger, uh, you have more volume inside compared to the surface to lose heat. So uh, they're less sensitive to operating in, in a cold environment. Uh, so that, that's one of the distinction that we have. And I would say that uh, we've been at it for 26 years and, and we pretty much uh, put a lot of science into this uh, field. Um, we have over the years developed al almost one product per year for all kinds of applications. And for each application we use a software for sizing. I think uh, from an engineering standpoint, uh, I'm proud to say that that sets us apart. Uh, and we've been very successful because, um, because with, this, with the proper sizing, you, you tell your customer, well, this can be done and this cannot be done. So, so you don't get into promising things that are physically, uh, from a physics standpoint, impossible. Uh, Brendan Spence has asked a question here, and I think what he's referring to, is because the coal cleaning on the lamps, um, as far as putting the lamps on the air on, on the air off side, does that really, does that really matter? How, how does that affect um, coal cleaning, having the lamps on the air on and the air off? Um, not, not sure, Dean, I understand the question. As far as upstream and downstream goes, oh, the new okay. installation, does it yeah. matter? Yes, it does. Uh, it does matter. Actually, if you're putting them upstream, uh, you're dealing with air that is not as cold and you're preventing the fouling from droplets hitting the lamps, from condensation hitting the lamps. Uh, but you need to size it with enough power to go through the coil and clean the opposite side. Uh, if you put them downstream, uh, yeah, you, can, you, will see, you will see a lot more water uh, you will see cold air hitting the lamp. What we do when we have that situation, we put more lamps. We have a correction factor in our program. And if you choose downstream in the calculation sizing software, it will put more lamps to do the same uh, installation. You will get a depreciation for fouling and a depreciation for lamp cooling. So, so uh, yes, so yes, it makes a difference. Another one is, I think we've covered this, uh, what is the risk of staff operated to the exposure of UV and how is this controlled? Well, you, you, there's always a safety switch on the door. Uh, when you open the door of the air handling unit, the, all the lamp shuts off and there's a sign on that door saying that there's some UV lights and do not uh, get inside if UV lights are on, but it's uh, what you've, you're putting this on is basically to to tell the operator not to force the switch <laughs> and open the and turn on the lights when he's inside. But typically, uh, and it's in our recommendation installation recommendation, and uh, Scott knows that he's installed many systems. There's always a safety switch that cuts off all the lights uh, when you want to walk in into uh, the air handler. Uh, another. One we have here, we have a few, so I'll try and go through this fairly quickly. Um, we have an anonymous attendee. Uh, as far as your coil cleaning goes, um, you know, coils probably have the majority of their surface areas hidden. So, how, so, so to speak, 
whereas UV reaches where the light can, well, sorry, where, whereas UV reaches where light can reach, how does a UV reach the bulk of the core surfaces? Well, by multiple reflection between the fins, uh, they do get there, but they get there with lower intensity. Uh, that's why you need more time to clean all the way through. Uh, the immediate surface where the light is seen directly uh, would get clean in a matter of minutes. Whereas the back end of the coil, uh, depending on the thickness of the coil, uh, will take anywhere between a few hours uh, and sometime close to a day before it goes through. And that's why when the coil is really thick and you have many fins per inch, our recommendation will be to, to, uh, to boost the, the, uh, the intensity on the surface from 250 to 500 if the coil is thicker. So you make sure that you get a penetration by multiple reflection that is sufficient to eliminate uh, the toughest mold within a day, which is basically its reproduction time. Uh, Ray Chang, Chang asks a question here. Basically, um, you know, UV is used on cooling coils, but do you need it on heating coils? Yes, you can use them on heating coils, although heating coils are less of a problem for molds. Uh, they, they don't survive very well the heat and uh, there's no water. So there's, there typically you can, you can do that, but it's just not a, a big issue for contamination. Um, so most of the time when you have to choose uh, to put UV lights, you put them strictly on cooling costs for that reason. Uh, David Dell asked a question here. Is it beneficial to trial Petri dishes inside the supply and return air of commercial office buildings to gain an understanding of what is actually being produced in the supply air and in what is returning to the occupied space. So now he's talking about mold spores and so forth. Yeah, air sampling is much more difficult than surface sampling. Uh, uh, Scott can tell you about that. <laughs> he, he knows a lot about this subject. Uh, it can be done, but it's very tricky. Uh, because all of a sudden you can have some mold, some spores up in the air, and sometimes you have not. It's, it's very erratic as measurements, very difficult to get a, a good grasp on airborne uh, bacteria. And some of them are difficult to cultivate also. On the coil, they, they pretty much grow by themselves. Uh, it's pretty easy to, 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 uh, to get samples. In the air, it's much more difficult. It, we've done that before. With air sampling, you need a, a statistical uh, way of doing it. You need to take uh, uh, lots of samples at different time of the day and to do a, a proper comparison. Uh, we have another question too from an anonymous attendee. How broad is the spectrum of UV light emitted by the lamp, i.e. above and below 254 nanometers? Do all lamps emit the same range of UV light? So I suppose what we're referring to there, you know, you've got your 186, Nanometers, you're 222. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yes. Well, there's uh, right now it's, there's a lot of uh, information that came that came to us about 222 nanometer. Uh, it's made by Eximer Labs. Uh, those labs are extremely expensive. They're not on the market right now, really. Uh, it's it's still a uh, a curiosity. They don't penetrate the skin, human skin, as much as the 254. But still, instead of uh, a dose of six millijoule, you can take 60 millijoule. That means instead of looking at a light for 10 seconds, uh, you can look at it for six times, 10 times, for a minute, but it's still, there's still a limit to what your skin can tolerate with a 222. Also, if you remember the curve, the sensitivity uh, to wavelength in this presentation, the 222 is less efficient. Uh, it's, it's down on the left side of the curve and uh, you will need a lot more intensity uh, over time, a lot higher doses to do the same disinfection uh, with that kind of light. Uh, as for also the 222 will produce ozone. It has enough energy to break up oxygen molecules and it will be an ozone generator, uh, which you don't want. So uh, ozone being a harmful pollutant. Uh, so that's why I, I, I have a, uh, 
mixed feelings about uh, possibilities of doing that. The other thing you've probably heard a lot is about LED, uh, UV LEDs um, on the same subject. Uh, UV LEDs right now are extremely inefficient. Uh, they're like five, 6% efficiency, energy efficient, uh, meaning that they convert only five to 6% of the input power into UV light. Uh, and uh, the typical UV output of those uh, units are a few milliwatts. They're, they're, they don't have much power right now. Uh, I've been following them for about 15 years, the, UV, the, the LED development. I don't see them coming to compete with uh, mercury lamps for another 15 years, uh, the way it's going. Uh, Cameron Robbins, um, I think we've already answered this question. As far as UV, um, degrading plastics such as PowerPoints or MSB regulators, et cetera, in wards and, and, and operating theatres when, irritate, when irritating these rooms. So I, I think you've already covered as far as UV um, on, on plastic. It's, you know, it takes a, a number of hours to, uh, to break down plastic. So I think we've already covered that. Um, John Hunt asked a question. Could you please comment on the following in relation to making engineering recommendations for use of UV for surface disinfection. The National Health and Medical Research Council, Australian guidelines for prevention and control of infection in healthcare 2019, discuss UV light as an emerging disinfection method. This is a condition, conditional recommendation against its use with the tech rationale that the evidence of effectiveness on clinical customers is low. Oh, well, well it's, uh, well, huh? yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, UV has been used now, it's, it's, uh, it's a proven technology. Uh, it's been used in water uh, for more than, than 40 years uh, in, in the air and surfaces. We've used it now for 25 years. We have tons, there's tons of publications on the subject, but mind you, it happens, it happens everywhere. I've seen that everywhere. Uh, governmental uh, authorities are sometimes very slow. It takes, uh, it takes them uh, 30 years before they get uh, on the program. Uh, even, well, ASHRAE, ASHRAE got involved back in 2008. Uh, before ASHRAE got into it, even the engineers were not uh, on board. So, uh, and that's normal that uh, people want to be uh, certain, want to be sure. I think for the, especially for the uh, uh, healthcare industry, which is very conservative. Uh, I know my daughter is a doctor and she works in a hospital. It's very conservative because you're playing with life of people. So uh, they want to be sure. Uh, but I think automation uh, systems uh, and smart systems will, uh, will take over. Uh, because again, one of the failing elements in everything is the human factor. If you leave it to humans to do proper maintenance and to use the unit properly, uh, that's where mistakes occur. So, um, and, uh, and it's quite understandable. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's our human nature to, to, to make mistakes. We have another question here. Do Cinevox lamps have any certification? Oh, lamps are not certified. Uh, lamps are manufactured certain specification, but the units themselves, from an electrical point of view and safety point of view, are certified. Okay, uh, we have another one. Have they been installed in Australia? Do they need certification to the Australian standards electrical? Are they TGA approved for farmer use? Who is the approved installer? So. Scott, you know, I'll uh, let you answer that one. Sorry, what's that? Scott, I'll let, I'll let Scott answer that one. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we've got the RCM um, tick of electrical certification for the units. Um, TGA approved for farmer use? No. Um, have they been installed in Australia? Um, many, many over, over a nearly 10 year period. We've got uh, bio walls in the new COVID ward at RBH. We've got pretty well every single air handler at PA Hospital, QE2, Logan, Bow Desert, 
Um, I think we just finished a project with 318 air handlers. Um, there's many uh, approved uh, installers. Uh, we don't do the installs ourselves, but we can organise them and we do teach people how to do them. Um, yeah, it's, 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 been, it's, been very, it's been very successful, actually. It's, um, and, it's, and, and we're garnering a lot more interest. And look, some of the installations are different. Like we've got the, the first bio wall, the induct air sterilisation that we ever sold, um, was to Queensland Institute of Medical Research and they were getting contamination in their DNA labs because DNA can be so small it will actually go through a HEPA filter. And when we're scan testing a HEPA filter, where say at H14, you've got 99.97% of um, filtration efficiency down to 0.3 microns, some DNA can be smaller than that 0.3 micron. So even though you might have a, a research lab um, you know, with terminal HEPA filters, you still can get DNA contamination. So that were the first biowalls uh, that, we, that we ever sold was for research. So um, I hope that answers the question. I'll hand back over to you, Dean. And another question you have is, how does UVGI compare with such technologies as ionisation, not only on COVID, but also for fungal and bacterial inactivation? Okay. Well... Ionization is a very old idea. It was used, it was used in the 50s and 60s as smoke eaters, basically to remove smoke from, uh, from environments when people were all smoking inside. And uh, the idea of ionization is to put electrical charge to a particle the same way when you rub a balloon in your hair and stick it to a wall. Uh, but eventually the balloon that sticks to the wall after rubbing in your hair. Arthur, you can't do that. Don't even try. <laughs> but, but that balloon, after it's got its electrical charge, will stick to a wall, but will eventually lose its charge and fall to the ground. The same thing happens with ionization. It's a way of getting those particles stick to surfaces, but eventually they will get airborne again. They will not stay there. They will lose their charge. Uh, so it's just a way to steer the dust, if you wish, if you, if you look at it. You're just taking it into one place, taking it to, the, to a surface, and then let it get airborne again. So it does not really remove anything. And ionization does not have enough energy to change the molecular stu structure of anything. It's just not the level of energy that can do anything, like molecular change the molecular bonds. Uh, it will add an electron, subtract an electron, which will give a charge uh, to a molecule, but that's, that's about it. Uh, we played with that in, in our lab many years ago, and we only found it was good to clear the smoke in a room, uh, in a cigar bar or something like that, but for it, it has no killing capabilities for a microorganism. It doesn't kill them. It makes them stick to surfaces. Actually, it may be even more, da more dangerous than nothing because it makes those... Uh, those particles, uh, those microorganisms stick to yourself, stick to the, the wall, to, to the table, to any surfaces. Um, so it's not a method really uh, effective for elimination. They, there's a lot of pretension, false pretension to my point of view uh, with uh, air ionizer right now. It's actually a very cheap, very easy uh, solution that was used, that was very effective for smoke removal when people were smoking. And now that nobody smokes indoors, uh, they sort of found another application for it, but it's false. It's not doing what they claim. Um, Peter McGarry has asked a question. Uh, will the presentation be available on our website? Yes, it will be uh, over the next week or so. Uh, we have a question here. Is an interesting question. Uh, do you have a method of detecting if the lamp has failed to raise an alarm for replacement? Yes, yes. Uh, our units, our commercial units like uh, BioWall and CoreClean come with a, an indicator uh, showing that the lamp is on or off or even if the lamp is due for replacement after 17,000 hours. So it prompts you to change the lamp because even if uh, a lamp at the, end of it, at the end of its life, it will have lost about 20% of its output. 
And at that point, we consider it's time to change it because it will lose about that 10% every year. Uh, the reason is the, the, the envelope of the lamp gets more and more opaque to UV. Uh, that's because of impurities reacting with ultraviolet. And although you still see some visible light coming out of the lamp, uh, the UV output drops. And after two years, even if your lamp still works, we recommend it's time to change. So our system will tell you after 17,000 hours to time to change the lamp. Uh, another question with UVC lamp for cooling coils, I believe the corners of the coil get uh, the least intensity of UV. So what is the bare minimum required of intensity at the corners at the end of the lamp life? Is there any standard or study to support this minimum required intensity? Okay, the first, uh, to answer the, the first question, first thing is all the calculations that you've seen are done based on the end of life performance. So the lamps are already depreciated in the calculation by 20% to obtain the results that you see on the intensity uh, on the surface. Now, the, when we said we need 250 microwatt per centimeter square on a coil, that's the minimum point. That's the point in the corner. Uh, and actually the, the, the simulation that I've shown are more like 400 in the corners. So 250 is really a bare minimum that you want to see in the corner. And they are based on end of lamp performance. That means that when you, uh, you start the unit, you'll be more like 300 uh, before you lose that 20% and get down to 250. Uh, so it's end of life performance based. So it's already depreciated by 20%. And it, the corners are really the minimum. And uh, that minimum is set to 250 for a coil that's 20, 12 inches thick. But that same minimum will be 500 if the coil is 18 inches thick. Uh, another question here, referring back to the um, presentation, what size water droplet is the most damaging by the way of viral carrying capacity for the MERV-13 filters uh, would capture? And, and another, another question we've got here, also would the fan energy penalty in going, in going to MERV-13 change? Well, I, I can answer that one. Look, as far as upgrading a filtration system, um, on, your, on your HVAC system, obviously, you're going to um, have a penalty on your fan because you've got more resistance on the, on the filter. So obviously, you need to um, upgrade your, your supply fan. But as far as the um, droplet goes for um, the vol droplet goes for MERV-13, I'll let Naman answer that one. Um, well, MERV-13 is sort of an optimum uh, filter versus you know, pressure drop uh, versus capture rate. Uh, above that, you're getting to, most system will see a drop in, in the airflow uh, because they're not designed to receive uh, higher grade filters. Um, the, the point is, to the idea with filtration versus UV is that mechanically with the filter and how much you want to let go and kill with, with, uh, with the UV light. Uh, it's complementary, and I often uh, say it like this, filters capture, but don't kiss. UV light don't capture, but kill. So uh, basically UV light makes no prisoner, uh, but it's, it's a complementary technology. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. I'm not sure I, I really understood the, all the details of it, all the nuance, but... Uh, that's fine. Um, does Sony Vox manufacture their own lamps? Are they exclusive to Sony Vox? Yes, the lamps are exclusive to Sony Vox. They're made, uh, we have our own recipe for the filling and the, the actually the tubing itself uh, is unique to us. So yes, we design our own lamps, but we have more than one manufacturer. We actually have three manufacturers making it for us. Uh, another question here, in a typical installation, would you suggest monitoring the usage and on off cycle via the BMS system? I think I can answer that one. Uh, look, as far as your BMS system goes, look, it's ideal to have the um, bio wall or the core cleaning system to your BMS because that'll give you an indication whether there's a fault. A red light comes up and tells you there's an electrical fault. 
or um, an ambient light comes up after 17,000 hours and tells you the lamp needs replacing. And a green light means that the system's 100% running, there's no issues. Uh, look, there's also a, a visual on the outside of the ballast box for call cleaning. There's an LED on there. If you don't want to hook it up to a BMS, same thing, you'll have an LED as a visual. Green's 100% go. Red, there's electrical issue and ambient, the lamp needs replacing. Uh, another question we have here. Is there any deterring factor if UV lamps are placed in saturated air streams? Um, say for the use in preconditioners. So I suppose what they're saying there in the supply air, if you've got a bit of moisture in the um, air, is it going to affect the lamps? Uh, you're, you're breaking up, Dean. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was basically if the lamps are installed in the supply air and there's a little bit of moisture in the air, will that affect the um, lamps? Yes, if you have moisture, well, moisture in the form of liquid and uh, it's hitting the lamp, eventually you will foul the lamp. So the lamp needs cleaning if it's subjected to fouling from droplets. Uh, that, that's, that's an issue that's common uh, it, when, when you have a lot of water. That's why when you have, you only expect lots of water uh, running down a coil. Uh, that's the reason why, if it's possible to install it upstream, uh, you're going to get better results. Um, Norman, I think the question might be in relation to say tropical areas with high humidity, um, outside air conditions, so you've got a preconditioner that's uh, accepting 100% of the outside air and then distributing that to a number of other air handling units? Yeah, as long as, you know, 95, 99% relative humidity, as long as there's no water droplets, uh, there's no effect. There's no effect on lamp. Relative humidity has no effect on uh, ultraviolet uh, effectiveness. Uh, as far as installing UVC lamps in 100% fresh air, would this benefit um, as opposed to return air on a air handling unit? So if you've got 100% fresh air coming in, is it is it beneficial to have UVC in the dark for 100% fresh air coming into a building? Well, if you assume that the fresh air is uh, pure, perfect air, you don't need to treat it. But most of the time they do contain uh, spores and uh, coming from plants, the pollen, all kinds of things. Uh, so sometimes they even contain in the cities, you'll find carbon monoxide in, in uh, some hydrocarbons. So he, your fresh air is not as, always as fresh as you think. Um, so normally it's, it's nice to treat both the return air and the fresh air at the same time. Uh, another question here, which is interesting. Thanks for your answer on the 250 microwatts per centimeter squared as a minimum intensity at the, uh, the corner of the coil for coil cleaning, the Kerspedil is Niger. But is there a standard in ASHRAE or third party independent study to support this minimum required intensity for um, you know, 250 at end of life? Uh, ASHRAE, ash Ash, yeah, ASHRAE recommends between 50 and 100 uh, microwatts. And uh, we found by experience that this may be sufficient on the immediate surface of the coil, but not deep inside, especially in the corners. So that's why we're using 250 uh, to give us some, some good safety margin. And it boils down to very little amount of, uh, if you look at the number of watt per Per square feet, it's not much at the end of the day. Um, so we prefer to use 250 uh, to make sure that the, we get full penetration deep uh, in between the fins, uh, especially in the corners of the coil. Uh, but according to ASHRAE, uh, between 50 and 100 is sufficient. And according to, to my friend, Dr. Kowalski, who wrote uh, the book again uh, on, on uh, ultraviolet germicidal radiation, uh, back in the early two.
uh, he did experiments with as little as one microwatt. If you if the coil was a flat surface without uh, fins, uh, it would be true. You can use one. Nothing would grow on it. Um, but the fact is that multiple reflection inside, especially when the coil, most of the time when you install these units, the coil is already fouled. It, it already is uh, colonized by mold. So the reflection between the, the fins are not so, is not so good to start with. So it has to, the, the rays, UV rays have to work their way through, uh, through the fins uh, to get it clean slowly and slowly by removing the biofilm. Right. One last question. I think I can answer this one from Omar. If UV lamps are installed on a cooling coil, how will it affect if the air handling unit is working in a heating mode? Well, you know, you've got the lamps installed in the in perpendicular to the cooling coil. So you've got the UV sh shining onto the cooling coil. If you've got heater banks down the track or heating coil running, well, no, it's not going to affect the, uh, the UV intensity or the UV cooling the mold on that coil. So that really concludes the question and answer session. Um, Naman, thanks very much. I'm going to pass um, the presentation over to Scott. There were a few last final words and we'll finish up. Thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks, Norman. <clears throat> always, a, always a pleasure and always very interesting. And I, I don't think I've been on a webinar that was so engaging from the participants. So thanks for um, being inquisitive, everyone, and asking lots of questions. Um, I think we've got one earlier on, actually, Norman, that we might have missed, which I think is a pretty good question from Cindy. Um, what are the chances of UV resistant population establishing itself on a coil? Okay, that, that's a question that comes quite often because we're used to uh, having microorganisms resisting to antibiotics and to chemicals. And uh, funny enough, the reason why UV made a big comeback in water in the early 90s is just because some bacteria, actually some molds were getting resistant to chlorine. And uh, that's why uh, ultraviolet was brought in the forefront to solve that problem. Um, the thing is with ultraviolet, because it attacks the DNA, even if you have a mutation, the new organism, the mutated organism is still a combination of DNA. It's still a combination of timine base and adenine and guanine base. It's still, the arrangement may be different, uh, but it's still an organism based on DNA. And we will still bombard that DNA with the UV light and basically damage that DNA to a point where it cannot uh, replicate itself. Uh, so, so far after, and I'll take this data from the, the water industry, after 40 years of massive use of UV light for water disinfection in major cities of the world, you have that also in Brisbane and Sydney and everywhere, uh, there is no sign of change of uh, UV susceptibility of microorganisms. So there's no risk of developing a, a mutant that would resist uh, the, the UV light, you know. The, uh, and I guess that, that question also stems sometimes from people who have watched movies like Hulk. That's uh, Mr. Dr. Bruce Banner being irradiated with gamma rays and turns into Hulk. Um, but that doesn't happen in reality with, uh, with our microorganisms. Another question I'd like to ask Naman, I get asked a lot, and I think we've still got a few people on here at the moment. Just because the lamp is glowing blue, that doesn't mean that, like, at the end of life, with the Sandy Vox lamp, at 17,000 hours, you get 250 um, joules of energy. But, you know, like other lamps on the market, if you don't, if you walk past an air handling unit and you've got the viewport and you see the blue light, some of these air handling units don't have a timer on them. So these facility managers and um, commercial buildings don't know when to replace the lamp because they, I think they get confused. I hear it a lot where they walk past and see the light glowing blue and they think, oh, it's working, keep walking. So at the end of the day, Mark, can you elaborate on, you know, the lamp glowing blue, just because it's glowing blue doesn't mean it's, it's going to produce enough energy to, um, to do what it's supposed to do. 
Yeah, correct. Because it's not the blue light that does the job. What does the job is a kind of light that we don't see. Uh, and right now, uh, if you compare two lamps after 17,000 hour, a new lamp and an old lamp, you'll notice that the uh, material, the true material is yellow. Uh, so it has lost a lot of transmissibility of UVC light. Uh, the blue light will still go through. Uh, the blue light is about 430 nanometer. It does nothing for disinfection. That's the light we can see. Uh, this one will still go through and you won't see the difference by looking at the lamp, a new lamp and an old lamp, the color looks the same. The, 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 the visible spectrum is the same. But if you use a UV meter, uh, you will find that it has severely depreciated after more than two years. It's about 10% per year. We've seen lights that were on for five, six years. Some, some of our clients say, well, I'm lucky. My light still works. I don't need to change it. Um, and, and I said, well, no, you, you have to change them because your output is down probably to 40% of what it was originally. Yeah. And now you, you, you're not doing the job. Thank you for that. Scotty, do you want to... Um finish the presentation, just last couple of final words and for closing. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, we've all, all got lots to do. Um, look, if there's any further questions, you can um, reach out to us via our website or, or our email addresses. Um, over the next few days, we've got everybody's email addresses. So we'll, we'll, shoot you, um, we'll shoot you some details so that you can get in touch with us if you need any quotations or some engineering or some specifications for a project or if you need us to do some presentations to um, your your colleagues and some of your uh, customers if you're looking after um, buildings or hospitals or anything like that we're very very happy to do that um, and we also um, you know Normart's also um, you know happy to like if we need to go through some work on a special project. He's always happy to be involved. So he's, he's been a great support to us over nearly 10 years. So um, yeah, and, we'll send something out. And as soon as I can travel, Scott, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to drop in Australia.